There you go. So I'm a, I'm a neuroscience professor. And that actually means two things. That means that I study the brain, and it also means that I teach about the brain. And there's something very recursive about that, right? I teach about the organ that enables us to understand and to communicate and to learn and to teach. So there's, I'm studying the same thing that I'm also teaching about, and at the same time I'm using the same organ to, uh, to do all of that sort of thing. Um, what I want to do today is I want to share with you some, some ideas, some thoughts about what studying the brain has actually taught, uh, taught me about, uh, about teaching and about learning and, and how I think that uh, education uh, should work. Um, when I start a neuroscience class, I very, very often, and it actually doesn't matter whether I do this with master students or bachelor students or whether I do this with like a guest lecture at some school, I very often start with one very straightforward and simple question. And that question is, um, why do we have a brain? And, and that seems to be sort of an odd question and a sort of trivial question almost. But as ans answers start coming in, and I ask for specific examples, like no, no definitions, usually the sort of answers that you would get are things like, uh, we have a brain in order to think or we have a brain so that we can have memories, or we can have a brain so that we can communicate. And that's true, that these are all very, very complicated tasks. They're like playing a memory game with like uh, abstract forms that you do not even have names for it. It's, it requires a lot of effort, and, and yes, we can do these sort of things. But to say that we actually have a brain in order to be able to do these sort of things is a bit like saying we have developed cars in order to be able to jump over big fires uh, in a st stuntman kind of way. I mean, yes, you can do this with a car, but it's not the reason that we have cars, right? They were actually developed for something completely different. Um, so to get inspiration about why we actually developed the brain, um, it's maybe a good idea to think about how to compare organisms that do have a brain with organisms that do not have a brain. And you might be primed now to think about zombies Im immediately, but um, what I'm actually referring to is like organisms like, like trees and plants. And if you then think about what's, what's the big difference between animals and trees and the part, the, the having a brain part, then I would say what the brain does is actually liberate you from being a slave to your direct environment. It enables you to uh, perform actions that actually change uh, the way uh, you are at that very moment. So it's enabling you to, to go somewhere else or to collect something or to show different behavior. And the core thing, obviously, about this changing of behavior, the core thing is the fact that you can move. And my, my thesis here is that we have a brain in order to move. Because every action, every intention, everything that you want to do actually requires you to contract muscles and start uh, doing something. This is a picture of my wife and myself doing something, scuba diving, being in an environment that we would never be been into if we, if we hadn't been able to like, uh, act according to our ideas and our actions. But this is actually not the reason that I'm showing these, this holiday picture over here. It's to to point you to a creature that you can actually find uh, very close by here in the south of the Netherlands, and it's called the, uh, the sea squid. And the sea squid is an animal that looks, uh, looks like this. And the sea squid is a very simple animal, it leads a very simple life. It's, it's stationary, it's stuck to a rock, or here in the Netherlands it's stuck to a dike. Um, it basically has, it has one, one opening, which is both its mouth and its anus. And basically, the animal just sits there and it waits for food to, to fall in, and you know, occasionally shit goes out. And that's, um, that basically describes the, the, the life of a, of a sea squid. Um, these, uh, these animals, even though they're animals, they have no brain to speak of, because they, they can't move, right? They don't need to move, they're just there. But the funny thing is if, um, that you have to realize that this is not how a little sea squid is actually born. 
Um, sea squids, like, like many other lower animals, have a, a larvae stadium. And a larvae stadium is, of a sea squid is a bit like the larvae stadium of a, um, of a frog. Um, it's, it's like a, a little fish, not a real fish, but a fish-like creature that, that swims around, basically looking for a place, a nice rock, a nice dike, to, 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 to spend the rest of its life. And as soon as it finds this place where it wants to spend the rest of its life, it settles there, and the very first thing that the, the baby sea squid does is actually eat its own brain, in the words of Daniel Dennett. But, and it's not actually eating it, obviously, but what, it, what happens is that the very first thing that happens is that the brain goes into regression, that it's being abandoned as if this sea squid wants to say, I've, I've, my moving days are over, I'm going nowhere, there's no need for this brain. Hmm, it looks really yummy. Let's let's use it as food for now. <laughs> so, so we have a brain in order to move, and this movement enables us to do actions. So if and this this is a blatant exaggeration of how things over oversimplification of how things actually are. But if we look at the brain, then roughly we can say that all these complicated co cognitive tasks that I was referring to, so the language, the memory, the, um, the thinking, the emotions, are all part of the really big thing that you see there in the brain called, called the cortex. And all the motor behavior, all the fine motor behavior, all the, the learning in the motor d domain, all happens in the small structure that you see over there in the back called the cerebellum, which actually literally means the small brain, the little brain. So you could imagine um, that it's, it's sort of wondrous to think why, why this essential function of the brain is actually all in this, this very small part. And there, there, there's two, two remarks to be made about that. So the first one is that the cortex, the big brain, is actually only big in primates. And in virtually all other animals, it's, it's tiny. In birds, for instance, or in lizards, um, the cortex is, is almost absent. It's, it's like just a little speck on top of the rest of the brain. So it's a very human-centered thing to, to think that the big brain is actually the big brain. The other thing is that even though the cerebellum is small, it's completely packed with brain cells. As a matter of fact, about 75% of all the brain cells that you have are in your cerebellum and are therefore involved in movement. And basically, the cortex, what it is, is, is it's a big lump of fat with just here and there a brain cell. Whereas the cerebellum, the small brain, the movement part, is a packed computing motor just there in order to, uh, to learn how to move and to, to conduct the fine parts of your movement. So speaking about, about motor learning, because that's actually what I study when I, when I study the brain, um, and now we're also moving to the, to the more the, the, the learning in general part. Speaking about motor learning, if, if, and that's something else I very often do with my classes as, as homework. At the end of the class, I say the homework for, for next week is that you guys need to be able to juggle uh, once you come back. And if it's, if it's a class where we have a good budget, I actually hand out the juggling balls. If it's a class and we do not have the money, then you're forced to get some apples in the kitchen or some, some oranges and, and juggle uh, with that. And um, what we also expect from you is to keep a diary and to tell us what sort of strategies you actually used in order to be able to, to learn, in order to learn to juggle. And it turns out that everyone finds out that there's basically three types of learning um, motor behavior, learning how to juggle. And the first one is instruction. So, so these juggling balls that you have, they actually they come like with a manual, right? So you, so you can read that. And it will say things like, um, throw the ball from your right hand in an arc to your left hand, catch it in your right hand, and this move can be difficult. It's often helpful to roll the ball in your right hand to the front of your hand with a slight downward motion of the hand before you throw it. And when the ball reaches its highest point, throw the ball in your left hand in an arc to your right hand, catch it in your left hand, and so on, and so on, and so on. And actually, you could take these papers, and you could, you could try to memorize them, right? And then you would be the perfect theoretical juggler. <laughs> but probably you cannot really juggle, right? I mean, if we would then put you here on stage, and we would ask you to juggle, you would miserably fail. Um, the second thing is that you can actually Copy, so you can watch someone else 
uh, juggle. You can see that on YouTube. You can, and this is in front of an audience, sort of an uh, exciting thing to do, but I can do it. You can watch me juggle while I'm talking. You can see the sort of strategies that I'm using. You can see what sort of things I'm doing, the sort of pace that I'm using, et cetera, et cetera. And just by watching that, you could actually also like, get inspiration on how to juggle. But I bet you that you can watch like 100 hours of YouTube videos some of someone juggling. And nonetheless, if I would put you here on stage, there's no way that you can actually juggle for yourself. <coughs> so the key thing, and I suppose it's sort of stating the obvious over here, the key thing is practice. You just have to do it yourself. And you have to make the errors and you have to find out what works and what doesn't work. And it's probably just practice will be hard because the instruction could help to guide you to, to certain uh, strategies and certain things to try. The copying might help you to shape up the things that you've found out and see you have strategies that don't work and then you compare it to what you've already seen. But it's the practicing that in the end will make sure that you can, uh, you can juggle. And actually most students can juggle after a week, especially if I tell them that they will fail class if they, if they, if they can't. <laughs> I guess the key thing to, to practicing when you want to learn to juggle, to ju to juggle is, is the act of ownership. Once you start to practice, the problem of being able to juggle becomes your own problem, right? It's, it's you who has to juggle. It's you who's responsible of actually getting the job done. It's you doing it. It's, it's an active process and it's your active process. And I guess that that approach of active ownership also transfers to my, my view on education uh, nowadays. So I think that if, as a student, you want to learn something, it's just a very good idea to, to make the problems, the things that you want to study, make them your own. It's, it's, it's the thing, so study things that you, that you want to learn. Study those things that um, in some way make sense to you, that, that are, are close to you, that you can relate to. If, if you are simply learning something because there's an exam coming up, or if you're simply learning something uh, because there's someone who says you have to study chapter three and four of this and this book because that's, that's our next assignment, then, then the risk that you're running is, is that your, your resume, your, your list of things that you can do, uh, maybe look pretty. Because you, you had an A in like redox reactions and you had, a, you had an A in like Russian history or so. But they're all balloons, they're all little bubbles of knowledge that are, are not connected to each other. They're just like simple tricks that you'd learned to do. Whereas if you actively engage in something, if, if it's something that, that you care about, that you own, if you feel responsible, if it's closely related to the things that you already know, then basically what this means is that, that you, you grow as a person, as a knowing person. And every new thing that you learn uh, is just another new layer on top of uh, the person uh, that you are. So if I, if I would have to say, what can we learn about learning by studying the brain? I would say, treat every problem that you want to study as if you were juggling. So practice and make sure that it's your problem and it's not something that simply comes from the outside, but it's something that you have to embody, practice, spend time on it, and make sure that you're an active owner of your own learning process. Thank you very much.